This video was made possible thanks to CuriosityStream. Watch TLDR ad-free and get exclusive access to videos from us by signing up to the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle deal at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDR EU. On Monday, Ukrainian President Zelensky applied to join the EU from a bunker in Kyiv. And this has put the EU in a bit of a tough spot. There's obviously massive political pressure to admit Ukraine in the name of European solidarity. But Ukraine's immediate accession would be utterly unprecedented. EU accession is usually a long and complicated process. And other candidate countries, like Turkey, have been negotiating for the best part of two decades. So in this video, we'll take a look at whether Ukraine will actually be able to join the EU, or whether the EU will have to take the controversial step of rejecting Ukraine's application. We're going to split this video into three parts. Firstly, we're going to take a look at EU-Ukrainian relations before the war. Secondly, we're going to consider Zelensky's recent application to join the EU, and why it's unlikely to happen anytime soon. And thirdly, we're going to look at Ukraine's prospects of becoming an EU member at any point in the future. So let's get into the first part and explore Ukraine's relationship with the EU before the war. In 1994, three years after independence, the EU and Ukraine signed the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement, a limited agreement that essentially just mandated yearly meetings between EU representatives and the Ukrainian leadership. The agreement came into force in 1998, before expiring in 2008. Then in 2009, the EU launched its Eastern Partnership, a joint initiative between the EU and six post-Soviet states, including Ukraine. The Eastern Partnership was also pretty limited in scope though. It essentially just provided a forum for improving political and economic relations with the EU which is why the EU and Ukraine started negotiations on a more comprehensive association agreement. This is where things started to get a bit tense. As we described in this video, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has been caught between Russia and the West. This all came to a head in 2013, when the EU's accession agreement was rejected by the then Ukrainian president, an agreement which Ukraine and the EU had been negotiating since 2007. This is because the Prime Minister instead wanted an exclusive agreement with the Russia-led Eurasian Economic Union. This decision was met with protests in Kiev, and ultimately the president was ousted in February 2014. His temporary successor then signed the political provisions of the EU's association agreement in March of that year. And a few months later, his successor signed the economic part of the agreement in June. The agreement then formally came into force on the 1st of September 2017, after ratification by all 28 members of the EU. So that's the timeline, but what's actually in this association agreement? Well, as we mentioned earlier, there are basically two sides to it, economics and politics. Let's start with economics. Essentially, the agreement includes a so-called deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, which aims to boost trade between the EU and Ukraine by gradually cutting tariffs and aligning regulations. When it comes to politics, the association agreement aims to encourage democratic political reforms in Ukraine, with the aid of EU funding via the Eastern Partnership Initiative and the European Neighbourhood Instrument. Because of this, since 2017, the EU has spent a total of 5.6 billion euros on Ukraine's state-building efforts. And on January 24th, von der Leyen announced a new emergency macro-financial assistance package worth another 1.2 billion euros. Nonetheless, despite improving economic and political relations between Ukraine and the EU, EU membership was still considered to be a long way off. This was both for a whole load of technical legal reasons, for example, candidate countries have to meet the so-called Copenhagen criteria and have suitable debt levels, but there were also big political reasons too. For starters, the EU has been suffering from what's known as enlargement fatigue, Taking in new countries takes up a lot of political energy, which the EU just didn't have thanks to its own internal disputes. And the latest Eurobarometer polling from 2021 found that 48% of EU citizens are against further enlargement, with 41% in favour. 
and there were solid anti-enlargement majorities in both Germany and France, both of whom are obviously very influential on the European stage. Not only was Europe reticent to expand, but Ukraine was also at the back of the queue, because it's both one of the largest and poorest candidate countries. Ukraine has a population of about 4.4 million people, and a GDP per capita of just $3,600 as of 2019. For context, Croatia, which joined in 2013, had a population of just 4 million and a GDP per capita of $13,800. It's not just that, though. Other candidate countries are, for the most part, both wealthier and smaller than Ukraine, making them more appealing options. So that was Ukraine's relationship with the EU pre-war. Friendly, but no imminent prospects of membership. But how has it changed over the last few days since Russia invaded? Well, the EU has been remarkably active in their support for Ukraine. They've shut down airspace for Russian planes, imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia and Putin himself, banned Russian state media, and even tried to supply Ukraine with European fighter jets. This supported action has been matched by rhetoric. On Monday, the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, announced that Ukraine, quote, belongs to us, and that they are one of us and we want them in. In reaction to this impressive support, on Monday evening, Zelensky applied to join the EU, signing an official request from a bunker in Kiev. In an impassioned speech to the European Parliament on Tuesday, Zelensky said that Ukrainians were not just fighting for their lives, but also to be equal members of Europe, and that without EU membership, Ukraine would be alone. Zelensky implored the Union to show that the EU was with Ukraine, and that they won't just let Ukraine fall to the Russians. Zelensky's speech was met by a standing ovation in the European Parliament, who later voted overwhelmingly in favour of Ukraine's accession. And at least 10 countries have since expressed their support for Ukraine's immediate accession. However, other European leaders were quick to stress that Ukrainian accession was still unlikely. Charles Michel, president of the European Council, said that Ukraine's accession was a difficult subject. And that's because there's basically three obstacles to Ukraine's accession here. Firstly, there's legal obstacles. Accession usually takes time. It requires unanimous support from the EU27, as well as negotiations with the EU in 35 different areas. Secondly, it could annoy other candidates. Erdogan has already come out and said that while he's sympathetic to Ukraine's accession, he doesn't think it will be fair to Turkey, who have been waiting to join for nearly 20 years. Thirdly, and most importantly though, Ukraine's accession could seriously annoy Putin and increase the chances of a genuine World War III. So despite the EU's newfound optimism, Ukrainian accession in the immediate term looks unlikely. But what about further into the future? Well, it essentially depends on the outcome of the war. If Ukraine can survive Russia's invasion, then accession will become inevitable. The war has turned Ukraine and the EU into, if not quite allies, then political besties. And previous concerns about Ukraine's economy or corruption will likely evaporate. But of course, this depends on Ukraine actually surviving the war, which is an open question at this point in time. And as we said, Ukraine aren't the only ones gunning for membership either. We made a video on this a while back, but Georgia have also officially applied for membership this week, following in Ukraine's footsteps. But not everyone is heading towards Europe. Some regions are keen, maybe even desperate, to move towards Russia. Transnistria, a breakaway state of Moldova, has wanted to join Russia for some time now, as we explain in our video exclusively on Nebula. The streaming platform my creator friends and I teamed up to build, but we don't need to worry about demonetization or the algorithm. Over there, you can find all of our latest videos ad-free, and we're also starting to post exclusive Nebula Plus videos over there as well. It's not just us either. All of our favorite educational creators are there too, like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Eagle, Half as Interesting, and many more. But wait, we said this video was brought to you by CuriosityStream, right? Well, as a platform full of the best documentaries available online, they naturally love educational creators like us. And as such, we've worked out a deal whereby if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description, you'll also get access to Nebula for free. That's not a trial either. You'll have access for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. 
To make things even better, for a limited time, they're offering a deal where you can get 26% off their already low price, making an entire year of both services less than $15. $15 for all of your favourite educational creators, as well as superb documentaries on CuriosityStream. Signing up at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDREU or clicking the link below not only gets you the deal, but it also directly supports TLDR and other educational content creators on the platform, as well as getting your original content and an ad-free experience.